The refusal of the government to address the problems of monopoly, the, the, the falling price of agriculture, uh, the falling wages uh, as they crush the unions, um, will lead to an economic crisis, and, and by the way, a severe restriction of the money supply, will lead to the economic crisis we call the Panic of 1893. This is the most severe depression in American history up to this point, and probably the second or third behind the Great Depression and the one uh, we're going through here in the uh, late, uh, uh, early 2000 teens and from 2008 and all that. In March uh, of, of 1893, the Pennsylvania and Reading Railroad Company has overextended itself. They've overinvested. They've become too aggressive, and they declare bankruptcy when some of their investments go bad. Two months later, uh, other companies begin to fail because they are reliant on this massive company. The National Cordage Company fails. The stock market collapses, and a number of New York banks just disappear. They don't have enough money to cover their, their, their cost, and they go out of business. As the banks disappear, they begin to call in other loans, and, and it creates a domino effect of collapse. What this leads to is, is contraction of credit. With fewer banks, there's, it, it becomes harder and harder to borrow money, and farmers particularly, who rely on borrowing money, farmers tend to borrow everything they need, grow the crop, and then pay back what they borrowed with the crop have a crisis. They, they begin to lose their farms. Aggressive businesses, businesses who have leveraged themselves too much in investments, also begin to fail. It shows how interdependent the economy was on every single part, uh, that a, rail, a East Coast Railroad goes under and all of a sudden the farmers of the Midwest are losing their farms in huge numbers. Within six months, 8,000 businesses, 156 railroads, and more than 400 banks have collapsed. Agricultural prices have completely cratered and 20% of agricultural workers lose their jobs. We will not recover from this until 1901. We'll begin to get out uh, uh, right around 1900, but we won't really get back to where we were until 1901. In 1894, an Ohio businessman named Jacob Coxey demands the federal government provide a public works program to hire the unemployed. The government, of course, ignores him because that wasn't our philosophy at the time. He organizes a, a group of unemployed workers called Coxey's Army and marches on Washington, D.C., although they continue to ignore him. Revolution seems possible. The Homestead Strike, which we talked about uh, a couple of chapters ago, and the Pullman Strike make revolution seem possible. Uh, the voices of anarchists and socialists and communists begin to be heard, and people begin wondering if this is the end of the American way of life. The country is completely terrified during the Panic of 1893. Cleveland believes that the money question is the cause of economic problems. The money question is, should our, should our currency be based on gold, meaning that every dollar we print is backed by gold in a vault somewhere? Should it be based on gold and silver, meaning that all our money would be backed by a piece of gold or silver somewhere, um, which would expand the money supply, right? Or should our money be based on nothing at all? Should it be based on faith? Now, before you think that's weird or crazy, that's how our money works today. It's not backed by gold or silver. The U.S. traditionally had been bimetal, meaning we had traditionally coined gold and silver. And a law back in 1873 had set the ratio of silver for 16 ounces uh, 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 for one dollar. But what happened is, as jewelers began to demand more and more silver, uh, and, and industries for that matter, the price of silver rose to well above 16 ounces for one dollar. So the silver miners, who could make more money selling it to a private business, just stopped selling it to the government. Basically, the government bought no silver for a very long period of time. I'm sorry, the, the 16 to 1 ratio was set long before 1873. Um, uh, in 1873, they're going to end the coining of silver. They're going to say, you know what, nobody's selling us silver anyway, so we're just going to stop coining it. Now, at the time, this made perfect sense because silver was worth too much to buy at that ratio. But in retrospect, when the price of silver collapses after a lot of the, the great silver mines in the West become exhausted, um, uh, people begin to see the crime of 73 as a conspiracy uh, to hurt um, farmers and silver miners. Um, and, and it gets this name, the crime of 73. Silver miners and farmers unite to demand that silver be coined. Remember, farmers want inflation. Increase in the money supply means inflation. Uh, silver miners want to sell their silver, so that makes sense. And in 1890, Congress passes the Sherman Silver Purchase Act where they say they will buy the silver, but they won't coin it. They will just simply put it in a vault somewhere. And this is to satisfy the silver miners, but of course it doesn't do anything for the farmers. Uh, they'll buy the silver and pay back in gold, by the way. Gold reserves drop. 
So America has less gold in the bank, so we can print less money. So not only does it not cause inflation, it does the opposite. It causes deflation. It restricts the money supply. This leads to uh, serious economic problems. And the president at the time, Grover Cleveland, says the Sherman Silver Purchase Act caused the economic problems. He's wrong. In fact, it's, it's uh, well, no, he's right. Uh, I'm sorry. The restriction of the money supply did cause them, but he didn't understand that. So Congress repeals uh, the Sherman Antitrust Act, and the Democratic Party permanently splits between West Coast and East Coast Democrats um, uh, who don't favor the coining of silver and uh, uh, Southern uh, farmers and Midwestern farmers who do favor the, the coining of silver.